1945, a German chemist named Werner Bergmann was diving off the Florida Keys when he noticed a really boring, inconspicuous sponge. It was covered in sand and algae, just a dull grey blob compared to some of the other more exciting sponges on the reef. But little did Bergman know, he was about to make possibly the most important scientific discovery since Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. For thousands of years, humans have known that certain plants and animals around us can be used for healing or harmful purposes. Whether it's the ancient Egyptians chewing on willow bark as a form of pain relief, to indigenous tribes of South America making deadly blow darts from frogs. With the advent of modern chemistry, we can isolate the active ingredients from these organisms and use them to make medicines and other useful products. Turns out that willow bark contains something called salicylic acid, a hormone which the willow tree uses to protect itself from disease. However, when consumed by humans, salicylic acid provides pain relief, and after much experimentation and development, by the early 1900s, a synthetic form safe for consumption known as aspirin was developed. So-called natural products such as salicylic acid are great building blocks for researchers looking to develop new medicines, or in other words, they are structurally optimised by evolution to serve a particular biological function. Now, unless you're younger than four years old, if you're watching this video, it's likely that you are a survivor of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I shouldn't have to tell you that new diseases are probably humanity's biggest threat other than, I don't know, climate change. But it's not just infectious diseases. Cancer and cardiovascular disease are massive problems too. Now, more than ever, scientists are turning to sponges for answers. Sponges are members of the phylum Porifera, and they're some of the oldest and simplest animals on planet Earth. Now, simple doesn't necessarily mean stupid or bad. After all, they wouldn't have survived for almost a billion years unless they had something right. Sponges don't have true tissues or organs. They're basically just giant tubes which are excellent at extracting food from the water. Imagine a stationary whale shark. Actually, to be fair, there are quite a few carnivorous sponges in the deep sea, such as the harp sponge and the ping pong sponge. But sponges are sessile, meaning as adults, they are permanently anchored to the sea floor or substrate. So how do they defend themselves from predators or neighboring animals trying to cramp their style? Well, the answer is toxic. Not now, Brittany. Many sponges harbor unpalatable or downright deadly toxins and some of them can even produce toxins on command when attacked by predators such as pufferfish. It's kind of the ocean's equivalent to stinging nettles or chili peppers. Additionally, due to their filter feeding lifestyle, some large sponges can filter over a million litres of water every day, which exposes them to massive amounts of pathogens or germs in the seawater. Because they've had close to a billion years of experience dealing with predators, competition, and pathogens, sponges are some of the best chemists on the planet. Let's go back to our friend Werner Bergman in 1945. Now, he was interested in sponges because he was looking for compounds known as sterols. And that's when he happened upon our humble protagonist, the sponge Tectitethia crypta. He collected some samples and placed them in boiling acetone, but he actually noticed a solid crystallizing in the beaker. Upon further testing, Bergman found that this mysterious solid was very similar to thymidine, one of the nucleosides or building blocks of DNA. So why would 
a sponge have massive quantities of a fake nucleoside within its body? Spongothymidine appears to act like a red herring for any viruses trying to infect the sponge. It looks so similar to the sponge's DNA that viruses are basically tricked into using it instead of hijacking the sponge's cells. But unlike the real nucleosides in DNA, spongothymidine is a dead end, preventing the virus from replicating and protecting the sponge from infection. Once scientists discovered the amazing abilities of spongothymidine to stop DNA replication, they realised it could be put to good use, fighting a seemingly unstoppable opponent, cancer. You see, cancer is just what happens when DNA goes out of control and won't stop replicating. After a few years of development, in 1969, the FDA released the first marine-derived drug, cytarabine, for the treatment of leukaemia and other cancers. Although it's not a perfect treatment and can have severe side effects, cytarabine has been shown to improve remission rates and overall survival time for people fighting this incredibly cruel disease. That was only the beginning for our superhero sponge though. In 1987, another sponge-inspired drug was approved, AZT, at the height of the AIDS crisis. Despite delays in research and development due to homophobia, AZT went on to save countless lives from AIDS. Finally, and perhaps most recently, Sponge-inspired drugs saved numerous lives during the COVID pandemic in the form of a drug called Remdesivir. But it's not just life-saving drugs that sponges are responsible for. In fact, it's quite likely that you watching this video have come into contact with sponge-inspired medicine. If you've ever had a cold sore, chances are you might have treated it with a cream known as acyclovir, a powerful antiviral agent also inspired by spongothymidine. Now, sponges lead the way when it comes to drug discovery, with around 200 new chemicals being discovered from sponges each year, and about 30% of marine-derived drugs originating from sponges. Okay, technically I need to say something before the microbiologists come for me. A lot of these compounds aren't actually produced by the sponges themselves, but rather bacterial symbionts living in the sponges. But sponges and their symbionts are far from the only marine invertebrates who've helped humanity. The sea squirt Ectinocidia turbinata contains a bacterial symbiont, which produces a type of compound known as an alkaloid. Not to be confused with vocaloids like Katsunamiku, the alkaloid binds to DNA, distorting its shape and eventually resulting in cell death. The sea squirt's juices have been developed into another drug called trabectidin, which is approved for the use in the treatment of soft tissue sarcoma and ovarian cancer. Aside from cancer, another serious malady which affects loads of humans is chronic pain. But what if I was to tell you that the ocean has produced a painkiller 1,000 times stronger than morphine, and it comes from the cone snail. Cone snails are highly venomous sea snails, which produce an array of highly toxic compounds such as conotoxins to kill their prey, and sometimes humans. Cone snail venom paralyzes their prey, but that ability to interfere with the nervous system is very, very valuable for doctors looking to treat chronic pain. A specific toxin called omega conotoxin has been developed into a drug called ziconotide, approved by the FDA since 2004 for the treatment of chronic pain. Last but not least, a polymer found in crustacean exoskeletons called chitin shows strong promise in the future of tissue engineering, drug delivery, and wound dressing. On an evolutionary time span, it's only very recently that us humans have figured out that we can use natural products as medicine, but of course, we're actually quite late to the party. Many animals have been known to use medicine, 
The most well-documented instances of this are in the great apes. This practice of self-medicating in animals is called zoo pharmacognosy. Zoo meaning animal, pharma meaning medicine, and cognosy meaning knowing. Evidence of marine animals self-medicating is much rarer, but the best example is probably in dolphins. Bottlenose dolphins in the Red Sea have been observed rubbing their skin on specific sponges and corals. And it's thought that they are anointing themselves with the secretions from these invertebrates to prevent or treat skin infections. It might sound hard to believe, but I think the fact that they seek out specific species of sessile invertebrates and display behaviours that are completely different from normal play behaviours is definitely quite compelling. And let's be honest, we all know dolphins are super smart, so I wouldn't be surprised if they've got whole underwater pharmacies. But even slow and simple animals have also hacked the amazing chemical defences of sponges. Decorator crabs pick up material like sponges and stick it to their shell for camouflage, but also as a toxic deterrent for predators. One of the most common predators of sponges, nudibranchs, even take it a step further accumulating toxins from the sponges they eat, basically appropriating them for their own defences. There's even a species of anemone which is known to form a symbiosis with a sponge living inside it for protection. The anemones were discovered off the coast of Japan and because of their resemblance to tempura were given the scientific name tempura actis. Now I'm sure we can all agree Tempura is really yummy. But you know what's not yummy? Antibiotic resistance. It's now been almost a hundred years since Alexander Fleming first discovered penicillin, and all of our antibiotic prescriptions are starting to add up. In the USA alone, Patients with antibiotic resistant strains spend 8 million more days in hospital, costing an extra $29,000 per patient. It's not just human health at risk, but also our pets, agriculture and wild animals. This is where sponges become even more important. Life in the ocean is far more ancient and diverse than on land, so it's quite likely that sponges have already evolved defences to these pathogens. We just have to find them. Now, all of these emerging discoveries and potential medicines sound fantastic, but unfortunately making sponge medicine is a lot harder than it sounds. A lot of newly discovered, initially promising compounds turn out to be dead ends, or just straight up copies of an existing chemical. These compounds can be incredibly complex, so it can take years for scientists to identify the active portions. The problems only get worse once you've actually identified the target molecule. Many marine invertebrates are lab shy and will only produce these compounds in very, very specific conditions. They also normally produce tiny amounts. There's also the issue of copyright. Can you claim to own a natural product that you didn't invent? An increasing problem within this industry is biopiracy. Biopiracy describes when foreign companies take biological resources from less affluent countries and communities for profit. It's kind of reminiscent of how colonial powers exploited crops like rubber and sugarcane. Finally, there are concerns about the overharvesting of sponges particularly from the deep sea, which we know so little about. Deep sea sponges can take hundreds of years to grow. In fact, they're the longest living animals in the world, potentially living for over 10,000 years. What researchers should do is use minimally invasive survey techniques, work with indigenous people and respect their tenure, and focus on developing sustainable aquaculture techniques to prevent over-harvesting. What we need to do is avoid using antibiotics unless necessary, always finish our prescriptions as per doctor's advice, and never touch sponges and corals when we go swimming. 